so now, instead of that, we have the fantastic, the wonderful, the brilliant, the person who you're going to give a genuine round of applause to as she makes her way onto the stage and not one of those sponsorship fake ones that you've been doing all morning. Rebecca Allen, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a haircut. Um, <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Craft Cons, for having me in that wonderful introduction there. My name. So, uh oh, uh oh, we tested this. Maybe it's just a blank screen and not my slides. So I'm going to start until this starts uh, clicking on forward. Um, I'm going to speak today about um, taking change and how we can make things that may feel quite big. OK, it's me again. Um, and how we can make it feel small or maybe a little bit smaller. We'll maybe give it a second and see if the slides are going to come up. <laughs> Um, but I can, I can maybe, I can keep us entertained. I'll keep us entertained whilst we do this. So you can see, I'm an engineer. I work at a company called Liveio, which is based in Berlin. And they're really fun. So I'm going to tell you briefly about them whilst we wait. I'd have done it in the talk, but we'll, we'll skip that a bit forward first. Ah, here we go. No, OK. Now, I can see, I can see, you're all, you're all waiting now to know what Liveio does, because we're going to go back to it later. Right then, making big changes feel small. Well, I didn't want to be too absolute on this, you know, so it's just so smaller, right? It's all relative. So I am an infrastructure engineer. And what I like to do is to solve problems, build things, sit around in an environment perhaps similar to the one that we documented uh, at the start of Emily's talk when she asked about how do you like to be? What kind of environment? What makes coding fun? Be in that kind of environment and solve problems. But then once these things have been solved, we have to think, OK, I've got this, this great solution. Oh, but now people need to use it. They're doing something else at the moment, and I need to get them to do this thing, because we have a solution that is good for the company, um, or a client needs it, it needs to be implemented for some reason. So how are we going to make that change? And so now I'm thinking, OK, we have that. Why, why would I want to speak about this? Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on myself, and then get into some of the tools that I would use to solve these kinds of problems. So I've spoken to lots of the speakers over the past few days. It has been a delight. It is wonderful. Um, and lots of, uh, lots of different experiences are found amongst those people. But there can be some themes as well, um, themes around uh, people's trajectory in their career often involves, say, taking a technical role, gaining a lot of experience in that, maybe doing some uh, consulting, following that, sharing that knowledge around, and then running uh, trainings and workshops and this kind of thing to follow. And now I've done that stuff, but just in a different order, quite a different order. So I started off accidentally becoming a management consultant as a graduate, did some jobs similar to that, then went into running corporate trainings before finally deciding there's something missing. Uh, I want to do a technical role. I loved coding when I was younger. I interned at it as when I studied physics. I want to do this. So I retrained and changed career. And so it could seem at some point as though you think, oh, no, you, you changed career. Is this, is this all a waste? What, what happened? Oh, I've got to start again with all, this, all the technical stuff, which I love. It's great. But then I had to do implementation. And in doing that, I realized this, this, this part here, I had learned a lot. And hopefully, uh, I can share that today. 
So this came to me as, a, as an idea of something that could be useful to speak about, and I really saw where these skills were useful. When I uh, had to make a change from using AWS's um, I am users to using their single sign-on solution. Okay, so this is something that uh, I'm not going to go into detail with today. If you want to email me later and talk about the AWS SSO, very happy. I have opinions. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is how I implemented that because it, uh, it you know, had the, uh, a lot of opportunity to uh, you know, cause problems. It would impact everyone who was uh, using AWS, obviously had workflows that went through the command line that uh, could affect uh, production deliveries, things such as this. So there's a chance for, for problems to come there. And so I'm going to use that frame to speak about this today, plus some of my other experiences as well. And so what I hope is that these will be tangible things that you can action and use out. Maybe everything doesn't suit you. Maybe everything doesn't suit your situation. Or maybe in spite, you'd say, oh, well, I tried that. I didn't quite, but I could do it in this way. These aren't necessarily absolutes that work for everyone in every situation. There is nuance to it. But hopefully, these will be good guiders for you. So we're going to split this into three areas. And the first thing we're going to look at is the solution itself. As I said, this is not a technical talk. But what I will be doing is just looking first at how can we approach the solution and look at what we're implementing um, to give us a good chance of success before we start. Following that, people, we have to talk to them. They have opinions. They have ideas. How are we going to do that? That's the next thing. And finally, because I want you to enjoy this, I want you to love implementation, we're going to talk about you. So what can... Uh, you do to learn from the process, enjoy the process, and you know, at least not burn out and resent it by halfway through. So firstly, the solution itself. So minimizing disruption is really what we want to do. So we have something we want to implement. I'm going to uh, mime it being here. This is our solution, the big orb of change. Okay? And when we, we have it, it solves a problem. It's being used for a purpose. But when we come to implementing, we want to do it in a nice, smooth way. So how can we minimize disruption as we're doing so? So the first thing, start sooner. Now, this doesn't mean rush things. It doesn't mean, OK, we're going to do everything, and we're going to do it yesterday. No. But it means looking for those times where you might find people saying, oh, yeah, 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 no, that, uh, we need to do something about that. But, um, uh, you know, but Friedrich did that. He did it three years ago and just kind of did that. And we don't really know what it'll affect. And he's left now. So uh, we'll, just, we'll just leave it for a bit. No. Everything you push under the carpet, it gets bigger. It grows. And in a few years, or maybe sooner, you or someone else is going to trip over that. And maybe lots of other things will fall down at the same time. So it's not about immediately solving those problems, but saying, how can we get the wheels in motion with this? OK, we don't know what the impact would be of making this change. So let's start trying to find that out. What actions can we take to begin moving forward with this? And the next thing is to stage the scope. This is related in that it's not doing everything immediately, but it's looking at you have the problem. There's probably lots of parts to it. What needs to be done now and what can be done in the future? Um, implementing the single sign-on solution, uh, there was the actual technical aspect of that. We are making this change. People need to change over. How will that impact them and their workflows? What can we do? And they were all smothered ideas, you know, because oh, I am permissions. We could probably rein them in. We could uh, you know, put in some more best practices around that. And it started to grow and grow. But no, it wasn't about doing all of that at once. What we wanted to do was take the SSO, the first thing, making that change to a single sign-on, and then come back later to look at revising people's permissions. And this is helpful on both sides to split up in this way and stage what you're doing. Um, and firstly, it's the idea that best practice isn't overnight. We're aspiring to it. It is a platonic form out in the distance. We're trying to get closer and closer to it. We don't have to do it immediately. 
And when we stage things, what we're doing then is we're giving a break to the users, and we're giving ourselves a break. Because when we're communicating change to people, it's a lot. And the more things we communicate, we think we're being really clear, and it's a great solution, and everyone should do it, and we know why. But they have the other things they're working on. So if we're giving them all of this, like, oh, yeah, you need to change how you log in, and also, um, oh, yeah, your permissions might have changed, so you might not even be able to do what you could before. So, uh, yeah, that's the thing as well. Um, but it's too much for people. So we need to stage the scope and bring that in. And this also helps us. Because something I've certainly found with troubleshooting that inevitably comes with change is that you get lots of odd questions. So people come to you and say to me, you know, not really. OK, all right, that's happening. We'll, we'll look into it. And usually you troubleshoot with them and find out that actually it's, you, know, you are the expert on this. And they obviously don't have that level of knowledge. They've not been working on it. And so they're quite, they see symptoms that are very different from what you know is the underlying cause. So if you can limit the amount of change, you are immediately reducing the scope for where those errors might come from when you implement it. And if we can do anything to reduce post-change troubleshooting, I think we should go for it. And the final thing with the solution is to be proactive. Yes, let's be positive. Let's be proactive. There may be things outside of your usual remit that need taking care of. So you've, you've made the solution, that's great, but maybe that's changing things. Maybe people don't have, uh, for example, the ability to give their teams new IAM permissions now. Perhaps they can't change that. So you're going to need a process in there. You're going to need a way of making that happen. And that might not be your responsibility. And at a startup, it's probably not anybody's responsibility. So if you want to make sure that this will go slowly and make your life easier in the future, be proactive and pick those things up. And maybe there are other people who should be doing it, and you can. Uh, get them involved, get their time, make sure they're aware early, get this, that being done. Or maybe sometimes you have to take on a few things yourself at this time, and then in the future work out how that will be managed. But be proactive and make sure it's being picked up, because that stuff doesn't go away. And now we're on to people. Now, this is the big bit, the chunky bit. Um, now, what I'm going to bring in here are some of my own ideas and experiences and the way that I have, I suppose, categorized them and the way that I, I would see them. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I think any, anyone can tell me that. But uh, we have Joseph, Joseph down here very kindly um, looked over my slides yesterday, and it has the seal of approval from a wonderful and exceptionally experienced psychologist now to say, at least it's not going to make him completely cringe. So we have that. <laughs> and so what we want to do with people is we want to get them on board. We have a great thing. We all want to build the company together. We want to implement the solution because we want the company to thrive, not because we want to irritate people or make their lives worse. So, you know, it should be easy to get people on board, right? We need to know our audience. And knowing your audience can mean different things. On the one hand, it could be, say, split by no, very technical people, we communicate one thing. Not so technical people, we communicate another thing. OK. But I don't want to do it that way today. Today, I want to look at reasons that I think underlie why people might resist change in broad categories and how we can adapt to that and adapt the message we are giving or the tools we are using based on that. So we will look at ideas of uncertainty, Effort is a good reason. It's a good reason. And the ego, which again, I'm using in a non-technical way. Um, but I will go into the details of what I mean by this as we go through. So uncertainty. I don't know how this will impact me. I am resistant to this change because I don't know what this means for me. And this can be one of the more 
uh, slightly easier things to identify because people are perhaps more likely to be a little more direct with this and say, I don't understand, or be coming with quite obtuse questions that make you kind of realize early on that there is a, a lack of understanding there. And so what we want to do is, first up, quite simple, explain, right? But we need to do that beforehand and regularly and often and so much more than we think. There's a great quote from a British politician in the 90s that I sadly couldn't find. But what he said was that until you are sick of hearing a message yourself, the amount you are saying it, that is the point where other people are just starting to listen. And that's the case when you're telling people how things are going to change, how this will impact them, probably unless they hear their name directly. You know, it's 50-50 if they're doing that or checking the Slack or whatever during the meeting. So keep explaining to people regularly and do it early on. Have a communications plan. Know who is doing this. Again, don't assume someone else is picking this up. And then once you've, you've tried to explain, you've done your best with this, but people seem unsure, then ask them. Because there can be a temptation to keep explaining, explain in a different way. Maybe I do it this way, maybe I change my voice. Do you understand now? And rarely is that going to work. We need to start asking people, OK, they seem uncertain. I need to dig into what they are thinking. What is the logic that's going on in their mind that is leading them to this uncertainty or to this uh, conception that they have about what's happening? So really try to understand that. And then you can find a way of explaining, essentially debug someone else's thoughts in a way. And finally, maybe you've been through this. They're uncertain, and now, gosh, you understand them, and even you're uncertain now. Oh, maybe we'd not thought of this. Maybe we don't know what the impact will be in this way. Involve them. Bring them in and collaborate. This is not all on your shoulders when you are implementing change. And as I said before, we have our uh, metaphorical orb of change here. Bring that person in, look into the orb together, and work out how you can solve this. So don't be scared to bring people in. We all want the company to thrive. OK. And now we have effort. I understand this. And this is going to make my life more difficult. Oh, no. Oh, no. People aren't happy. No one wants their life to be more difficult. I don't want my life to be more difficult. No. And but how much more difficult? And for how long? It can be easy to have people come to you, these things, say, no, this isn't going to work. I have to do this thing. I don't want to do that thing. No. Mm. This, it doesn't work. I have to do stuff. And it can be easy to say, oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I should have. I'll, I'll think about it. I'll find a way. But what we want to do is to work out what the real impact is there a little more objectively. Sometimes it's going to be small. Oh, I no longer have an IAM user, so I don't have static credentials in the command line anymore. So uh, I've got I to do a little, little command and, and log in in the morning. Oh, oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not, a, it's not a big thing, though. Of course, look and see. Maybe there are other aspects, other things it's affecting. Could make it bigger. But in this case, we're saying this is quite small. And that's because the person who is perhaps taking issue with this is seeing it very much from what they have to do. They're seeing there's some creep to a little more from them. They're saying, mm, OK, not happy with that. So here we need to explain. And this isn't a cop-out. I used the word explain in the previous slide. I mean it in a different way. We want to explain, but explain the context of why they should really be OK with this. So, looking on the one side at the current situation and saying, OK, this is why this is not tenable. This is why we can't continue in this way. These are the problems with it. 
And these are the threats that the company may have if we continue in this way. If it's security, make it really tangible. Find examples of uh, threats that either, you know, brute force attacks that are coming to the company, perhaps it impacts something like that. Or it could be that uh, you find statistics from another company that make it really tangible to say, oh, we're not isolated here. This is real, and we need to think about this. We can't assume, ah, oh, our employees are fine. I'm sure our ex-employees won't use that SSH key that's lying around. <laughs> let's not assume that, OK? So let's explain on that side and really make it more real and concrete. And on the other side, then say, the reason we're doing its change is because this is what the future can look like. And I'm not saying we don't have to paint a wonderful utopian picture and treat people as children, but I'm saying, say, look, this is a problem. This is going to make it better in this way. This reduces the risk in this way. So really stop people seeing this as, hmm, I have to put in more effort. And see it as, OK, I have to put in more effort. But oh, wow, I see why. And the next thing are temporary changes. So. Somebody does have to put in more effort, and not temporary changes, temporary efforts. It's a permanent change. It's a wonderful change. We want it forever. Temporary effort. So there is a big learning curve that people will have to go through. They may need to make time for that. And so here, we should support them. Support people in every way we can. And one of the main things coming through here is when people are coming to you and perhaps having issues with what's happening, not to minimize that to acknowledge that. And maybe we need to reframe it or uh, give them more information, these kinds of things. But let's not minimize it and say, oh, it's, it's not really, uh, no, it's, you'll be fine. Let's support people. I love documentation. I love it. It's great. It reminds me how I did things. It's, uh, it's helpful. It's, there's nothing better than the feeling of when someone comes to you with a problem saying, oh, this, this doesn't work. And you're like, oh, have you, uh, have you, have you gone through this? This dark, right? You've, you've done the, yeah, yeah. 10 minutes later. OK, it's, it's working now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So document well, document wisely. Um, support people and make sure they know up front. If they need to plan to have extra time and extra capacity in the next quarter because this change is happening, let them know, acknowledge that. And finally, they've got to put in a big effort. If someone has to put in a big effort, then Let's collaborate. We come back, the misty orb of change. I'll keep referencing this. I run a lot of Dungeons and Dragons games. There will be lots of misty orbs of change and this kind of thing. So let's collaborate with people, bring them in and acknowledge, OK, right, this solution actually doesn't take that into account yet. How are we going to do that? How are we going to solve those problems? And finally, we have ego. And so here. I feel this threatens my status or my identity. And now I'll admit, when I started writing this, I did have a, a couple of caricatures in here. Perhaps it was a little, seem, would have seemed a little unsympathetic to begin with. Because perhaps we do come across with people that maybe our friends are like, oh, they, they just want to feel big. The company's growing and they don't like it because they're used to being a big fish in a little pond. Now the pond is large. Bits of the pond are closed off to them. And so they're, they're not feeling good anymore. And so they don't, they don't want this thing. They say, no, no, I don't think this applies to me. I'm, I'm too important for that. Or you might have another type of person who is saying, uh, oh, no, I, th I think with this problem, you'll, uh, you'll find your solution doesn't work for these reasons. Um, I, I have lots of knowledge, lots of experience. And for these reasons, it doesn't work. I'll go into lots of detail about them. We can't do it. No. And with these caricatures, I realized I have those caricatures as part of me. I like to think they don't take over. I like to think that they don't become everything. I can keep in control. But there, there are certainly times where I'm like, I'm going to say a thing. It's not completely relevant, but I want to prove that I know it, that I do this. I feel bad afterwards because it does not help the conversation. It never does. Um, but we all have this there. And then the idea of identity. So if you are making a change, how does this affect how someone might see themselves? That's important. On a really big scale, 
you might have, uh, like away from this, this technical thing, like with change management, you think of consultants coming in and firing lots of people. That's a, that's a big change and that's a huge threat to people's identity. It's a threat to their livelihood, definitely how they see themselves. But on an everyday level, I'm always thinking, oh, this, that project's happening and okay, this person's working on that. I wonder how that affects the type of work I'm getting. Or I wonder how, okay, I see myself of this and growing into that, but now this thing is happening, so c can I still go this way? Do I need to go somewhere else? And circum I'm constantly making these small adjustments and having these little thoughts about how I feel about me. So let's have a bit, I, I've essentially grown this into having a bit more sympathy um, about the idea of these caricatures I started with. And so the first thing we want to do here is set the tone. So if someone comes to you with negativity, being really blasé, or like, oh, this doesn't apply to me, or mm, this is terrible, it will never work for these reasons, then you can set the tone. You can, you don't have to match that. And it's really easy, particularly when people are being cynical. We get lots of cheap humor out of being cynical and negative. But if we want to actually move forwards, then we need to not fall into that temptation of getting those cheap laughs and going in that way. Let's set the tone and role model what we want to do. And then involve people. If you have someone in leadership who thinks, this doesn't apply to me, no, no, I'm too important. Show them that they're a leader. If they do this thing, other people will follow. They set, well, everyone says company culture, but they set, they can lead from the top and they can influence people so that they don't have to feel as though they're becoming a smaller fish in this growing pond. They don't have to feel that things are closed off. Show them that they can have influence in that way. Give them that identity that they see for themselves. And the same with people who might be very critical in a technical way. They probably have great ideas. They may have seen this a million times before and seen it fail and really, uh, but they're smart. Let's involve them. Say, okay, well, how can we? How can we solve these things? We need to do the change. Let's, let's align on this. Um, let's, let's work together. So set the tone and then involve them so you can give people that identity. Show that you value their intelligence and their ideas. And finally, importantly, get support. Hopefully, when you're doing something, management are supporting you. But maybe they don't know what kind of support you need. I once worked in a job where um, I, I started it. I knew I was going to be doing special projects for the CEO of a travel company. And I didn't know what those special projects were going to be. And I also didn't know that when I got in on the first day, that CEO would say to me, OK, um, here's your special project. Yeah, we, we want to make the Dutch market better. I got some market research we did. Here, take this market research. I'm going to South Africa for three months on holiday. Goodbye. Great. So I'd gone in and management seemed to support me and say I could do something, but they don't told anyone. No one knew what I was doing. I'd not met the right people. And what I'd needed in that situation was to have them say, communicate um, what level of authority I had or let people know and expect what I might be doing, what my role was. And so you might find yourself in a situation where that hasn't been communicated or where people aren't clear and they might feel threatened because they don't know why you are doing this or feel like they're having something forced upon them, get support and borrow the authority of higher management. Get them to show that they support you and they're happy with you doing these things. It will help. And finally, you, the most important people. Enjoy it. How can we enjoy it? Oh, I have a great time. I did some implementation. It had a ball. OK. So to do that, let's have some boundaries. And boundaries can be many things in different ways. Uh, I have very strong work-life balance boundaries having been burnt horribly early in my career in that regard. Um, and so boundaries, in this sense, I'm going to speak about in two ways. And the first thing is having deadlines. There will always be problems. There will always be people who don't tell you when you are asking for use cases and making sure a solution works. Well, they don't have time, they didn't listen. They're not going to tell you until stuff starts breaking. So set deadlines, communicate them, do your best, solve as far as you can, 
but know that in the end, get this done. It'll be done by this date. It's not then you will feel better. It's not hanging over your head. There are always pieces to pick up. So let's do what we can and then implement. And then separation. I find this difficult. My immediate response is not to do this. We come back, the misty orb of change is in front of me. I am not the change. This is the, it can be very easy. Someone comes to you with a problem and negativity. Oh, it doesn't work for this reason. Oh, I've got a problem. My, my, I will admit, my initial response is like, oh, no. They're going to realize that my solution is terrible. I obviously didn't think of something, and now everything's going to come crumbling around. I mean, they've pulled that thread. Oh, no, oh, no. Usually, they've just not read the documentation, like nine times out of 10. Occasionally, there's some troubleshooting. But my initial response is not to see the problem or what I'm doing as, as outside of me, but to identify myself with it. Be like, oh, if this isn't perfect, then that means I'm, I'm a problem. I'm, I'm not, oh, no. So let's get it here again. We're doing this. Other people have approved it. We're not alone at this company. It's here, not on our shoulders. We collaborate together to make this better. And although that's not the first thing my mind tends to think, I can kick that into action pretty quickly, and I can calm down. And then I am much better at problem solving, and much better at troubleshooting with people. And then perspective. It's a job in the end. It's a job. We do the best we can. We are conscientious. We are good employees. We want to help people. We want things to succeed. We have good intent. But it's just a job at the end of the day. Again, it's not us. And also, if we're not getting, let's have perspective on the support. If we're not getting support from management, from our team, let's not kill ourselves trying to push this. Look after yourself. And if you're not getting what you need from your company, communicate, try that. And then maybe this isn't the thing that you should be working on, maybe even not the place you should be working. But don't push these things and keep pushing through when you're not getting the support you need. And finally, on perspective, don't apologize for change. It can be easy. You have lots of negativity. And often, no one's going to come to you and say, oh, it's, no, maybe some people will come to you, actually. Some people will. Fewer people will come to you and say, it's great what you're doing, how you solved that. And this thing, oh, I love it. It's like, mm, the majority of what people say is, yeah, you've not thought of this, or I don't know how this is going to work. And, Oh, it can, can be easy to then go, oh, I'm, OK, sorry, sorry for doing this. If you're changing things, you're doing it because you, as I've said repeatedly, you want the company to thrive. You want things to be better for everyone. And you don't need to apologize for that. So that's everything I wanted to speak about today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, as I said, my name is Rebecca Allen. Um, Please do email me if you have any uh, questions or you try these things out or situations. I'm very interested. Um, and because my name is exceptionally common, it's obviously a wonderful name, uh, there's a QR code for my LinkedIn profile because it'll be easier to find. Thank you. <laughs>There's nothing wrong with an exceptionally common name. <laughs> Take it from me. Rebecca, there's your booze paid for by the speakers. Thank you. We have time, so that means we have time for questions. Do we have questions up here? If not, I have them preloaded on my... Oh, they're here. We can read them. Are you okay to take... We've got just a couple. <laughs> yeah? I'll read them, you answer them. Deal? Deal. Why is the focus on making the people to enjoy the processes? Wouldn't it be better to create processes for people? Ah, uh, well, let's look at clarifying some uncertainty then. Um, enjoy the process is something I wanted to have for you as someone implementing. So I apologize if I didn't make that clear. So in the section, in the section of people, I think creating processes um, that, just to check I'm understanding this, wouldn't it be? Yeah, creating processes that are going to work for people internally for, well, there may be reasons you need to implement things because a client needs it or someone won't solve a contract, uh, won't sign a contract without doing things. That will happen. But yeah, we want to aspire to do it for people. And enjoy the process with, I suppose, a little bit of a, 
uh, an aspirational way that I wanted you to see the idea of implementation, because it can be something that seems like a bit of a drag. We want to get back to, um, yeah, solving problems, building stuff. That's what I enjoy. But how, what can we make sure we get things out of it? Thank you very much. Do you believe everybody can be led through the change? That's a fun way of putting that. Can be led through the change, or is it better sometimes to let someone go? Uh, can be led through the change. So there might be changes where someone may not fit in a team anymore. Um, it could happen. And that could come in multiple ways. So it could be that you see that being the case. I think there isn't space for these, this skill set on the team anymore. Or on the other side, it could be that they say, oh, this. Uh, this isn't for me, I'm not happy with this, and that's why they may decide to go. Um, the main thing is to be open and transparent throughout everything. And this comes back to the ideas um, of the communication from the start. Be open, be transparent with people, because otherwise rumors will start, and we don't want that. So particularly if you see this might be happening, get on top of it, be clear, and communicate with people. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said on how you would manage situations where people may not be suited in a company anymore for various reasons. Uh, there's probably a lot of talks that can be done about that, but it's certainly something to prepare for if you think that will be happening. Yeah. Hey, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Uh, what would you do if you are in the middle? E.g., the idea is coming from higher management. Boo. How can you <laughs> win yourself for the change? Ah. So how can, you, how can you woo yourself, so you in the position? Um, OK. Yeah, coming from, oh. I've got a couple of things filtering into my brain, thinking which is most relevant to say. Um, understand why management are doing this. So perhaps flip around the things that I said, uh, these look at reasons, and try to put that onto management. And you may not come out and say, oh, it's now a great idea. Yeah, but at least you can understand. And maybe they're doing it because they're terrified of their boss, or they're terrified of something else. Or maybe there are actually very good reasons, but it's just, I mean, often like we want to use a new technology or do something fun, and then we have to do a boring thing instead. Or like, oh, let's, AWS has a solution for it. Let's do that thing. OK, sure. Right? It's not necessarily what we want to do, but we may be able to say, OK, I understand the reasoning. So I think the first thing is to yeah, understand why higher management is doing that. Get a perspective on, on them, and then make your decision from there as to how you feel. Yeah. Rebecca, thank you so much. A huge round of applause for Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs>